Good morning, everyone. Well, that was pretty good. I'm impressed. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm glad to see you all here this morning. Really appreciate you uh, coming for this special honor to welcome Beth Ford back to Purdue today. Beth doesn't do that many of these types of lectures right now. She's all over the country doing so many different things, and we really appreciate her taking her time to come to Purdue University. She's been instrumental in building and maintaining a strong relationship with Purdue through their support of the Land O'Lakes Experiential Learning Center and Purina Pavilion, the Land O'Lakes Global Food Challenge Internship with a number of our students who have taken advantage of that, an endowed chair in ag economics, and many other activities at Purdue. Land O'Lakes has really been a great partner to Purdue, and we're proud that Beth is here to talk to us today with both faculty, staff, and students about building a sustainable future. Beth was named president and CEO of Land O'Lakes in August 2018. She's only one of 25 women who sit at the head of Fortune 500 companies. Before her current position, she held a series of successful executive positions in the company. In 2017, she was named Chief Operating Officer of Land O'Lakes Businesses, where she oversaw Land O'Lakes Winfield United, Purina Animal Nutrition Dairy Foods business units. Prior to that, she was head of Land O'Lakes Dairy Foods and Purina Animal Nutrition Businesses, where she led record performance and growth, leveraging innovation through R&D to strengthen both brands. She also was instrumental in the acquisition of Vermont Creamery in early 2017. And for those that don't know, many of this is dear, dear to my heart as an animal scientist who was involved with purine animal nutrition and as somebody who came from Vermont, so knows Vermont Creamery. Prior to joining Land O'Lakes in 2011, Beth had excelled in executive operations management and supply chain roles in international flavors and fragrances, Mobile Corporation, PepsiCo and Pepsi Bottling Company, and Scholastic. She has more than 20 years' experience in the areas of technology and R&D across these four companies. Beth is an Iowa native who earned an MBA at Columbia University Business School and a BBA at Iowa State University. So please join me in welcoming Beth Ford. Jason Lusk, who most of you know. He's the department head of ag economics and a distinguished professor, and he is going to be here to have a conversation with Beth. Let's chat, <laughs> shall we? All right, well, thank you, Karen. Um, Beth, we're really thrilled to have you here. Uh, thank you so much we'll for taking time. hold your judgment. Time. Okay. We'll see what that looks like at the <laughs> I'm, end I'm pretty today. confident uh, yeah. we're, we're gonna be happy that okay. you're here, but thank, thank you for being here. It's a, it's a real honor. Um, so just in terms of plan, we'll have a little chat here for about 45 minutes or so and then um, open the, the floor to some questions from the audience. So Great. if you're sitting out there in the audience uh, and you, something comes to mind, you might hold it for a few minutes and, and you'll have a question to ask, ask Beth here in a minute. So as, as you probably know, here at Purdue, this is our 150th anniversary and there's four themes that the university has been celebrating and one of those is a theme of, around sustainability. Mm -hmm. And at Lando Lakes, you're intimately involved in the food supply chain, all the way from um, ag input supplies to farm to the retail. And um, you know, in that context, you know, what does sustainability mean to you and to Lando Lakes? And how do you implement that con concept in a business like Lando Lakes? Yeah, I, I think the farmer. So we, you know, Lando Lakes uh, retains farmer ownership. We're a co-op. Um, in fact, we have some of our members here and board members here um, today. And um, I think the original environmentalists, the original entrepreneur is the American farmer. And they have every reason to continue to invest in their land and improve um, sustainable production. So when we think of it, we think of it right at the farm level all the way to retail. Now, there has been increasing, um, not just pressures, but increasing interest from consumers about sustainable production, um, making sure uh, especially with the discussions of climate change, that production at the, at the um, farm level is sustainable for the long term. And that is the investment that farmers make every day in their land. They want to hand it over to their children, to the next generation. Many of the farmers that we work with are you know, third, fourth generation farmers or more. And so they have every reason to invest in their land and continue um, down that journey. 
Uh, you know, so I think that, you know, how do we think of it? Well, we think of it right at the farm level, our tools. We just launched uh, our Truterra platform, and it is a technology platform. It has over a trillion data points where we can use this information and a farmer's information aligned with applied research plots that allow them to get a better visual, you know, we also have satellite technology, a better visual of different um, uh, productive areas of their farm and where they should invest, where they should reduce investment, what different changes they can make that can monetize um, the changes where they're improving or increasing their sustainable production. And that's really important because the ag economy, many of you know, and who of you uh, from, farm, from a farm yourself? Yeah, quite a few. And so it's a very difficult time. It's been a challenging time. And so a farmer, like any businessman or woman, needs to make sure that what the changes they make are productive and profitable. So we think of it in terms of tools, technology, leverage of technology, our own insights, and then working with them to improve this and do it at the, t at the same level or, or at the same time as improving their profitability. One of the things that I think comes up quite a bit is whether that can be priced in the market. Mm -hmm. So do you get a differentiated price because your, sustain your production is sustainable? And I would say that probably most instances is the price of admission. You're not necessarily going to get price up for sustainable production. It's an expectation for consumers. Um, so consumers, in many instances, are in charge. They're making a value-based assessment of who you are. And when I say values, it's not the monetary values. It's who you are from a person. How do you treat your employees? Are you aligned with what's going on in the environment? Um, and so it, for many, this is the, the price of admission. We do see um, uh, companies focusing in and wanting to make sure that they're working with ingredient suppliers that, um, are, that have sustainable production. The question is whether they'll fund that or help fund that over the, over the long term. It's sporadic, I would say. Um, so there are many, many elements of the, of the response to that question, whether it's consumer side, working right with the farmer, and then, of course, sustainability up and down uh, the value chain, which is relatively unique for um, Land O'Lakes, since we go right from the farm um, all the way to the store shelf. Sure. So let's drill in a little bit more on those incentives to adopt some of those sustainability practices. Some maybe like the new technologies that you touched on, you know, it's a benefit to the farmer if it lowers production costs, but presumably some of the things that are being demanded, you said there's a lot of pressure, might cost the farmer more money. You indicated mm -hmm. maybe it's a price of admission, but to what extent, you know, are consumers willing to pay more for some of these things? And how do you get that supply chain to maybe channel some of that money back to the farmer? Or is it just going to be a, this is the price you have to pay to, to play in this business? Well, you know, there, there are a lot of answers to that question. I, I think, you know, so you could look at it and say, well, is organic more sustainable? And I think that there's a perception that's true and that's not necessarily true at all. It might, you know, conventional organic may not be more sustainable um, for the long term for the environment, and you know that. And so, you know, the question is, are people deciding that they're going to pay more for that? And again, people are making a values judgment. What I find interesting and really actually kind of concerning is this idea that there's a, an assessment of a good food, bad food narrative, the good food, bad food. And so I, was, I had a very um, you know, near an experience where I was at a swim practice for one of my sons. And um, the mom next to me was saying, well, you know, this year I'm not going to take, we're not taking any vacation. And I'm not going to buy any clothes and stuff because I'm going to make sure my kids all get, I'm going to only shop at like this store and we're only going to have food that's like um, organic and things like that. And I said, you know, I was listening to your conversation. Might I have a word with you? Because um, I want to talk with you about what is true, you know, what is it you're trying to achieve. And no matter how much I spoke with her, I couldn't convince her. And I think what happens is people are left with guilty feelings. I'm less of a mom if I don't buy this kind of food for my child. And I think it's a very risky proposition in this good food, bad food kind of a scenario. So can you price up? Well, in some instances, the question is, is there real foundational improvement in health or in um, climate um, impact to the climate? I, you know, I would argue that some of this is marketing and some of it is um, you know, true sustainable production. The way that we're seeing farmers monetize this, to me, is more exciting. And one of the ways that we see them 
uh, I'll use California, some of our dairy producers in the Central Valley. Um, we've been working with CalBio, and there was a government um, policy in California to reduce methane um, by, say, 40% for our dairy producers. And we have some fairly large producers out there. And so what we found is that there's a natural gas line um, going in from the Central Valley down to Los Angeles. And we partnered with um, the government there. They gave an allocation of, I would say, like $90 million. And then we allowed for, for a loan from, for our farmers to put in you know, a digester, methane digester. So they get, um, they get methane capture. They clean it. It goes into a gasket. It gets put in the line. And it goes down to um, Los Angeles. And it, fuels the city buses. I mean, that's the circular economy. That's the virtuous circular economy. And then the, you know, the, the water is used to go and in, in, you know, in, in, you know, clean the barns and do things like that over the long term. So you know, this, to me, is a different way of thinking of it versus is the consumer willing to pay for it? The consumer, in many instances, is being messaged, good food, bad food, non-GMO, GMO, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and at the same time, the farmer it doesn't necessarily translate into an improved price to the farmer. And there are other ways that they can make investments, like I'm mentioning here in California, that I think improves their profitability, because now they can sell um, the biogas in the marketplace and improves their operation and, and efficiency on their farm and is better for, you know, for uh, society. Sure. So you mentioned your, your dairy producers out in California. So I want to ask a little bit just about animal agriculture. I know you have a lot of. Um, you know, dairy member owners or dairy uh, producers as owners. And there's been a lot of concern expressed mainly in the media, uh, but in other quarters about animal agriculture in general. It's, you know, all kinds of concerns about health, environment, animal welfare. And um, you know, really, I'm just curious on your thoughts about where you see the future of animal agriculture. Where is it going? Um, are there, you know, you know how, do, how does the industry engage in some of these concerns? Or will, is it a passing fad? Or is this something that's here to stay and we'll have to deal with in some meaningful way? I don't think it's a passing fad. You know, the whole economy is built on innovators and entrepreneurs. So I, I get this question a lot when I'm in New York or elsewhere. And it's, um, you know, do I get concerned with the impossible burger and the mm -hmm. you know, cell base and the plant base? And I'm like, you know, you do you, and I'm going to do me. Um, <laughs> the, the reality is that. Um, that's a small, it's growing, but it's off a very small base. And guess what? Animal protein is growing as well. And it will continue to grow because when folks get in more into the middle class, they come off of plant based diets. Interesting statistic um, you know, uh, vegans or vegetarians, um, you know, four out of five only retain being a vegan or vegetarian for one year. And then they go back to some level of animal protein. So it's not to say, oh, proves it. it. The fact is animal agriculture will continue, um, animal protein will continue, and will continue. So where I don't need to get into an argument about this good or bad, because that's not productive. Instead, what we want to do is work with our producers on improvements that they can make in their operation that will be more sustainable. Um, you know, We had a, a speaker at our um, mid-year meeting who was taught, who's an expert in this field, and um, we talked about the fact that methane only stays in the atmosphere for 10 years, and we've had kind of flat animal numbers. So this is not one of the big drivers for, for issues right now. Um, but yet, of course, it would look at, you'd say, oh, geez, isn't this 14%? I mean, the numbers fly around. Is it 14% of the problem, 15% of the problem? Um, again, I think we are where we are. Animal agriculture will continue. We will continue to work with our producers. Um, and um, we'll continue to work to make improvements, and they want to do that as well. This, isn't a, this is being forced on them. This is what they do. Um, I want to remind everybody, 96% of farms are still family owned. Okay, so this isn't some, this big corporate farm is doing this. You know, how do farms get bigger? You know, the, the farmer decides to retire or leave, and so the neighbor buys the property or buys the land. Um, this isn't some transition to um, large corporate farming, which again, in and of itself, um, you know, puts a visual for people as though this is this is a bad thing, um, and you know, and I would argue that that's not been the heritage and the nature of what happens in the evolution of the increase of um, farm size. This might be heretical to ask, but some of the other you know, ag companies have considered investing or have invested in some of these plant-based or cell-based alternatives. Has that been anything Lando Lakes has considered, or is that too, uh, 
uh, is it not in your strategic mix of, of alternatives? It's not a primary. Um, we, we look at all options, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we're not doing that right this minute, but of course our R&D teams look at all of these uh, alternatives and our marketing and our consumer goods areas continue to look at this as well. Yeah, speaking of your R&D, uh, whose idea was it to come up with the taking a stick of butter and just splitting it in half? I, I love those <laughs> in our house. Brilliant. Yeah, I don't know. That's... Let's just cut it in half. <laughs> right. You know, the half stick, it is very interesting <laughs> because the, the um, automation of that, the manufacturing, mm -hmm. we have a very specific agreement with the, the company um, the manufa that manufactures that line, and as long as we buy one line every couple of years, we retain that um, special um, differentiation in the marketplace, and so um, we're, we're pretty careful with that. The half stick is really interesting, because right, what, one of the things we found is that people don't like to touch butter, so if you're cooking, it's easy to just unwrap something and put it in there. The other thing is that people like fresh butter, and so if you're a uh, you know, young couple or, um, you know, you're kind of, you don't have a large family and you don't go through as much butter. In it. But I'm asking you, why wouldn't you go through a lot of butter? <laughs> <laughs> Judge you. Um, but but that, it, it ends up being, a, you know, perfect because it keeps it fresh. And um, so there are multiple reasons from a cooking perspective, from a lifestyle perspective, and it's one of our fastest growing areas of that uh, butter portfolio. Yeah. Now, we were talking just a little bit backstage about the ag economy in general, and it, it's been a tough time for a lot of producers, particularly dairy uh, producers. Um, you know, on the dairy side, are we going to see more exits and bankruptcies, more consolidation? I mean, what, how do you see this shaking out on, in terms of the economics of production agriculture? Um, yes, we probably will see continued consolidation. You know, uh, I think a concerning number to me in probably 2001, I think is in the year, there were 90,000 registered dairy producers, and today there's 50,000, and it's consolidating at a 6%, 6.5% uh, rate right now. Um, you know, it has been a significant length of time where the market has been depressed, and, and it's been overproduction because guess what? Animal numbers have not come down. It's about 9 million um, you know, milking cows now, and, and genetics has improved, and um, animal husbandry has improved, and feed quality has improved, and so milk output continues to grow. And then when you get more consolidation, they're able to hold on for a longer period of time, and feed costs were lower um, because of grain pricing being lower. So there's multiple facets. I think we will see some additional consolidation in the dairy sector. Um, you know, all the farmers and the dairy farmers, the growers and everything, they have my unbelievable admiration. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is these dairy producers and many farmers, the average income has been 44000 The median has been minus 1500 They're living on loans. And the only way many of them are making money is by the second job they have, the third job. You know, they're driving a truck. They're teaching school. They're doing other things to maintain their farm um, and their way of life. I think we haven't reached, I, I did see a, a statistic about the debt um, in the farm economy. It's reaching where it was in the 1980s during the farm crisis, but of course we don't have as much variable rate interest, so they aren't seeing that 13, 14% interest. That's allowing them to hold, um, hold on, and then we've seen land values kind of hold um, their values, so that's been, um, you know, been important. So we will see some additional consolidation. Um, animals will move, will move um, because they can't hold on for forever. And um, many of them would wish to be able to do this. I, you know, again, nobody's giving you a medal if it's 3 a.m. and it's a blizzard and you're out because you've got a problem with the manure pump. You know, a pump of the manure. You know, it's just, and that they do that kind of work and they want to do that kind of work. Um, and so I think there's shorthand, like, but, you know, if you're smart and you're young, you should go to the city. And, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, a lot of people, we should admire the sacrifice they're making, but it's not even a sacrifice to them. This is what they do. They do the hard work. Um, and so it's heartbreaking. It's very challenging when you're with a, a producer or a grower who wants to do the hard work, and we should be grateful they're doing the hard work. And it's very difficult for them to hold on without taking on additional jobs. And even then, they can only hold on for so long. Yeah. Is there, you know, 
not to end that discussion on a pessimistic note, are there any optimistic signs? Yeah, in terms you know, of the milk, uh, milk supply is balanced a little bit now. Um, we haven't seen as much because it was multiple years in a row of an increase of a couple percent, um, one and a half percent, one percent, two percent. Um, so it's getting a little bit more in supply in different regions. I think in the West Coast, all milk price is tipped up over 18, 18 and a half dollars. I think depending on if you, you know, I think the average dairy producer now has probably got 400, um, you know, 400 heads. So um, I think that right now we're seeing a, a strengthening of milk price, and in some areas they're making uh, money, uh, and that's important. What's always interesting to me is they reinvest in their land or they're paying off that. I mean, they know how to strengthen their balance sheet for the next turn. Um, so I do see some uh, a bit of a lift. I see milk production kind of stabilizing. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing, and as you know, I'll be leaving here to go into D.C., is that we need passage of USMCA. It's critical um, for, for agriculture, um, critical for dairy. It's the number one dairy market that we export to, and one day out of seven in dairy production is exported to different products. And so, you know, the cows are milking every day, and you've got to find a home for the milk. And um, export markets in agriculture in general um, I've been critical to the profitability and the long-term uh, sustainability of, of production agriculture. So we need passage of USMCA to stabilize um, the market. So share a few more thoughts about policy. As you mentioned, you, you're going to DC right after this and you, you're mm -hmm. very engaged uh, with our elected officials. You know, what, what, what do you sort of see as the role of farm policy sort of at a, at a general level? You know, there are some that say, you know, this producer support is needed to, you know, help the struggling farmers that you just mentioned, stabilize prices, help deal with um, excess supply. And there, you know, but there are others that, you know, worry about um, overproduction, environmental consequences, uh, health issues, or what have you, you know, just sort of as a general position, what, you know, how do you think about farm policy and what, what it, appropriate farm policy should be? You mentioned the trade side already. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I spend a lot of time talking about trade. Um, I'll also be spending some time talking about immigration, immigration reform, um, because, you know, farm workers, access to farm workers. Guess what? You know, the, the increase in wages for the farm economy has outstripped the increase um, in uh, regular wages. But um, I don't see a lot of American citizens standing up and saying, I want to do that work. Um, probably 40, 50 percent of farmers are more we're not able to access enough labor. Um, and there isn't enough automation yet in the sector to offset, although some in dairy are getting into robotics and robotic milkers, milkers and everything because of this um, lack of access to uh, workers and then lack of access um, you know, to, uh, or, or the um, increase in wages. Um, so you know, I think that the policy issues around, around um, immigration and around trade are central. We've had a strong dollar that hasn't helped exports. There, but there are a couple of other things that I uh, want. I talk a lot about. I think people think of it, especially in the cities, that like, oh, the farm economy is struggling, as though it's completely disconnected with your life, <laughs> you know, and it isn't because we have a shared destiny in the cities and in um, rural communities. And I'm concerned about policy issues, about infrastructure investment in rural communities, especially especially around broadband access, technology access, because the ability um, for a family or for anybody to strengthen their community, and everybody wants a strong, vibrant rural economy, um, is directly related to opportunity. And so you have situations where people are taking their children to the McDonald's or the Dairy Queen to get broadband so they can finish their homework, because they, they don't have it in their town or they can't afford it in their home. And um, you know, 25 to 30 percent of farmers don't have access to broadband, and right now that's inefficient. In about five years, that'll be catastrophic. I mean, that is the pace of change and the leverage of technology, not just an efficiency on the farm, but you know, we're not ceding the territory. I mean, we're not giving up, you know, the the, the land, and then you know, suddenly we're going to hit the button and it's going to all come back. I mean, people will leave. And we see stores closing. We have a shortage of 40,000 doctors. We have an opioid crisis in rural America. Three of four, three of four farmers or farm workers um, have been directly impacted by the opioid crisis. That is a stunning number. You can't take advantage of telemedicine, teleeducation. You know, there's the entrepreneurs. I mean, these are these are critical issues. So this policy issue, I talk very directly about immigration and um, uh, you know trade. 
but I've been really pushing on these other investments because it doesn't just stop to say it's really been tough times for the farmers. These are surrounded by towns that lack then investment because the farm economy is central to the strength and vibrancy of that rural town. Um, and you know, so it, many universities don't recruit students at these towns because it's not profitable, because they don't have enough students who can afford to go to college. I mean, there's a, a, you know, a significant number of issues um, that are policy issues that are central. So I do spend quite a bit of my time. We also have a government affairs team um, and a communications team, and I spend quite a bit of time on these issues because they are central, given especially that Land O'Lakes is a farmer-owned, member-owned business. Our members live in these um, communities. Our business is done in these communities. And we need to have investment um, you know, for, for them. And frankly, I would argue that this is a security issue for the United States. I mean, it's been one of the foundational, fundamental things for the strength of the US economy. Uh, you know, a, a healthy, um, not just profitable, but efficient food source um, and, and um, food production industry. And you know, it feels like we're, we're forgetting that. We get into a city and we're like, you know, we go to the grocery store. The grocery store always has stuff, you know, as though that's going to be just present. And uh, guess what? Those we have a shared destiny, mm -hmm. and we need investment in these communities. Yeah, I like that concept of shared destiny. I'll pro I'm going to steal that and use it. So you're welcome you to do it. <laughs> okay, please. good. But no, but keep, please, please do because you know what? This is we we need to raise awareness. And when I go out and I speak, or when I talk about this, the encouragement I take is even when I'm doing have, giving a speech in you know Chicago or New York, they'll say we we didn't know. We didn't know that there was a lack of access. We didn't know that there was a shortage of 40,000 doctors in rural America. We didn't know about all these things and how can we help. And we need, we need that. And I, I, I'm not trying to overstate it, but many of these places, I'd say it's like the rural, some of these rural towns are becoming like the inner city and we should think of that. You know, I want, of course, you to have the nice library in downtown Chicago. I'd like for some basic investment in technology in the towns in rural America so that they can in continue, to, um, continue to develop businesses and raise their family. And, and we should all be grateful that they want to do that. Yeah. So I'm going to shift gears. You've been, we've been talking about you know, the US, although you talked a little bit about trade and you talked about investments here in the US. But Land O'Lakes has a pretty extensive international development uh, mission. In some ways, it's a little strange because you're, you know, you're owned by U.S.-centric, uh, you know, producers in some sense. So, talk a little bit about, you know, why Land O'Lakes would be engaged in international development and how this sort of fits with your goals as a company. Yeah. Um, well, it's called Venture Thirty Seven. Actually, uh, we now have have changed because it, it used to just be international development. It really wasn't a distinguishing, um, you know, brand. Um, but we work with a lot of smallholder farmers, especially in West Africa. But we've worked in a number of different places. And so the the um, the genesis of this really was probably almost forty years ago. And our farmer members, and I think this is again one of the things that I admire so much about it. Um, they saw the neighborhood, they always want to work on continuing to prove their, improve their towns, and they saw the neighborhood as the world. And they knew they had information to share um, about farming and agriculture so that they could help other economies improve their food security, um, and then eventually, you know, potentially grow their own business here in the United States. So our board, our farmer members, they're very actively involved, very supportive of this. Um, it's usually funded, the projects are funded by USAID, by the Gates Foundation, by other um, organizations, so it's an NGO. And um, you know, so how does it fit with our mission? Well, it fits with the mission and the culture of what we do at Land O'Lakes. Period. Now, having said that, we have more recently stepped into a more commercialization of different businesses. We have a business called Villa with crop protection um, uh, business in South Africa. We're building a mill uh, with Bidco in Kenya. We do some work in China um, with a partner from Europe. Um, we invested in, in the Dairy Institute in China. We do some business in Mexico. We have some operations in Canada. I mean, so we, we are not broad, multinational. Let's say that you know, 7 8% of our revenue is coming from international um, areas. But 95% you know, of the population lives outside the United States. So I think you'd be well served to understand what international markets are doing, and then some instances be very basic and go in um, with, with our, uh, you know, with our um, assets and our 
not necessarily our brands, but our our R and D, our understanding of technical issues with um, animal and production agriculture. Yeah, well, the you know the investments you talked about as as your farmer member owners uh, viewing their neighborhoods. I mean, it seems like one of the the neighborhoods y'all care about are land grant universities. Um, we do. And as Dean Platt was mentioning when she was introducing you, uh, Land Lakes has been very generous with this land grant university with Purdue. So first, thank you for yeah. that. You're um, welcome. Well, it's not just me. It's our it's our board and our foundation, and you know we think Purdue has got a spectacular. It's a terrific university. We have a number of Purdue grads, um, and plus the investment and in research here has been you know very much aligned with what we do at Land Lakes. Well, yeah, and I think um, um, you know one of the things I've enjoyed about Purdue are connections to organizations like Land Lakes, and uh, uh, Dean Plout mentioned you know our animal science pavilion that y'all helped. Uh, we have an endowed chair in our department sitting right there, uh, Alan Gray, who has Land O'Lakes uh, endowed chair, and several of our students. Um, I know both in our Department of Agricultural Economics and the University have been involved in the, the Global Food Challenge that you've done for those. So, you know, just talk a little bit about, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with some of those activities, and, um, you know, we know what's in it for us, <laughs> what's in it for you. Well, I mean, I'd say multiple things. Um, first of all, we do think you have some of the best in class research. And so we like to be connected. You know, sometimes we'll do a discrete projects. Sometimes we're learning. Um, that's that's critically important. Obviously, there are a lot of students here that we think highly of, and um, you know, it, this is a key market for us in Indiana and elsewhere in the Upper Midwest and elsewhere because it's not like Indiana. You graduate from Purdue and then you only stay in the region, right? You go everywhere in the world. So um, we do it because we want to recruit the best students, and that, I think that that's important um, for us. We also understand kind of this public-private pri partnership um, that is beneficial, I think, from not from just the business perspective, but from the economy, from the learning um, perspective. So we, we really concentrate our efforts with a few key universities. Purdue is one of them. Um, and we want, we, want, um, we want that partnership. I'd say, you know, oftentimes when I'm speaking, people say, Land Lakes, we love your butter. And then they kind of leave it at that, you know. I'm like, I love the butter, too. It's awesome. Um, but it's a fraction of the business. And let me tell you what we really do and why this business is so interesting. And so that opportunity to um, help people understand what it is that we do and what the business is and what we're focused on, and all, I mean, that's just a terrific opportunity. So uh, you know, we concentrate our efforts with universities who we believe are aligned in, um, in their research. You know, one other point I would make. What I appreciate and what I'm hopeful for from the universities that we partner with is that they will be advocates for appropriate, to me, use of science in industry. So I appreciated your president coming out with a very strong statement about GMOs, because that was a technology that was almost going to be lost. And, um, and so I, it takes the, what, what many would perceive as an independent voice um, an experienced voice, deep in research, like a university, like a professor, like a dean, like a president, to make that point. Because if I make the point, it's like, oh, well, of course they have something in it. You know, it's, uh, you know we get a little bit of pass because we're farmer-owned. So they could, I could say, oh, the farmers, um, we can represent the farmers. But the universities, I would encourage to be active voices, and you students to be active voices for things that you know are aligned with science and research. Um, and unfortunately, there are a lot of voices in social media or marketing or things like that, that that oftentimes drown out the facts. And that's a problem. So universities who have that depth of, of knowledge um, and are willing to stand up and say, wait a minute, this is, you know, I think your, your university president said this is a moral issue. Right. I mean, here we were just talking about our development group, and these technologies can help save a family. I mean, it was literally that intimate. Um, so we hope for this partnership um, where we're, we're sharing information, but also we, would, we love the universities who step out, the leaders who step out to kind of, I don't want to say debate, but put a halt to, I think, false perceptions that uh, are developed in social media. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for that encouragement. That's uh, good to hear. You talked about one of the reasons you uh, come to Purdue is to recruit um, students. 
uh, for those students who are in the audience uh, that might want to work at Lando Lakes or one of the affiliated companies, what advice would you give them uh, to be both an uh, attractive person to hire, but also as a successful in their career, no matter what they, what they choose? Well, I mean, I say a couple things. First of all, you have such an, a unique opportunity on campus, and I know you're busy, but be well-rounded. You know, I, I love it when I get a, a good resume. They've got a good grade point average, but it's not everything. And now, I'm sorry, teachers. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't listen to that part. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Beth, I'm sorry I asked it. You know you should know the answer before you ask that question. <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, it, is, it is important to have a foundation of decent grades, don't misunderstand. I love it when you got a 4.0, but you know, to me, you have to be a whole person. We hire the whole person. So I like it when they're involved in their, and you're involved in a club or your house or something in the community, or you have a job, um, especially if it's a kind of a, not a sexy job. You know, I clean toilets. That's how I pay my way through college. And not because I say, oh, everybody should go out and clean toilets because that's not fun work. Um, but you, you do this because what, you want, what I want to see is the work ethic, the willingness to work hard and do the tough things. I think it's important, no matter the business. This is not unique to agriculture. It is not unique to any, it's not, you know, I've been on the trading floor. I mean, it's just that ability or that willingness to have the intellectual curiosity to continue to learn and to do the different types of things. Um, the other thing I always tell interns when they come in with us is that you'll, you're smart enough. I mean, Purdue is not an easy school to get into, so I'm going to assume everybody's smart enough to figure out the jobs, right? Um, careers are built on relationships. Careers are built on relationships. And so when you understand, especially in this role, it's really little about you, and it's really about enabling others for, to, to achieve their success. It's about making sure at every level, including right now as a student, Hey, you know, do you want this job? Or we're thinking about you for this job. And you say, you know what? I'm, it's not really right for me, but Sally, I was working with Sally, and she, you should talk with her. Enabling and understanding that this isn't a zero sum game, that this is about long term relationships in your career and in your life, I would say would be most important. So while you're here, take advantage of all of the different opportunities. Because you want to become more well-rounded, develop your um, desire for and your, your push and intellectual curiosity, um, but build relationships. They will stay with you throughout your life, throughout your career. And I have had people that have worked with me or for me three or four times in my career as I've moved across companies. I mean, I still stay in touch with my, my friends from grade school, literally. They have stories, and I don't want them shared. On you know, they're like, oh, I see you're back in the Midwest. I said, like, zip it. We don't need to talk about the you know the, the event down by the river. Um, but but those relationships are so important. It is the fabric of your of your life, and it's it is so central to successful careers and career development. Yeah. So shortly after you were. Uh named CEO, there was a Time Magazine article that quoted you, and you said you would rather talk about the challenges of helping farmers feed a growing world population. Uh, you'd rather talk more about that than your personal life, but I'm gonna mm -hmm. ask you a question anyway. Um, you said, now that I, <laughs> qu quote, uh, and it's not gonna be anything about down by the river. So, okay, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, who called you? <laughs> right. But your, your quote was, uh, I'm being announced as a CEO, not a woman CEO, not an Iowan CEO, or a gay CEO. Uh, but that being said, in agriculture, you know, it's often viewed as a very male-dominated field. Um, it's something sometimes the diversity and inclusion we've struggled with a little bit in agriculture. You know, what, what can we do to make agriculture and agribusiness a desirable place to work for women and minorities? And what advice do you potentially have for young women in the audience who are interested in a career in agriculture? Well, I think agriculture and food production itself is is such important work, such meaningful work, and I think it's perfectly aligned with, with women. So we have actually an increase in the number of women we recruit. We probably now have 40 plus percent um, in our company, and that's improving. I think that um, it's always the pipeline. Do you bring them in and then do they rise to the top? That's the bigger concern that I have, and it's any industry. It's whether you're continuing to, um, to get promotions at the same rate and whether you're staying in a line job, which will qualify you for more senior roles. So the advice I always say is, please get diverse and get broad early in your career. Please take the field job. They'll say, oh, the job at headquarters and they'll feel great and I'm gonna wear this nice clothing and it's gonna be terrific. And you should not not do that, but I, I, there's a huge value in your career for early 
stages, getting opportunities to be a leader and opportunities to understand how a business really works um, because you'll be more credible. And the breadth of experiences, take a sideways move, take a downwards move, you know, do something different because, again, it gives you so much more opportunity as you, um, you go um, further in your career. And it is a bit of a pyramid, right? So they're going to look for who's brought us. And they'll especially look for those. And I look all the way to, C, you know, to COO, EVP when I hire and down um, at the line level, whether they are able to be a good leader of people, no matter the job, head of tech services, quality. And the reason is you won't know everything. And if you have the humility enough to realize you don't know everything, but you're smart enough to understand that others want to engage with you and you can ask for help, um, then you can be a good leader of people. You want to develop good followership and have that experience. So getting broad early and then being a good leader of people, I think, is, is uh, centrally important to a, a, you know, an effective career management. Um, you know, this, this other thing, this characterization of diversity in the sector, I think that people who want to do meaningful work would find some of the most, I mean, this is the most meaningful work of my career, and I've worked in, you know, in publishing, and I love that, again, because it was meaningful work to me. Scholastic, children's book publisher, it's about literacy in children, and who doesn't want to do that? So, yeah, I, I'm going to do that. Um, but I was in the oil industry, I was in consumer goods, I was in chemicals, I've worked internationally, I've worked in a lot of different businesses, and it felt like all of those experiences put me right here where I'm supposed to be. With a breadth of experience and an appreciation for the structure and for the, for the members and for the team. Um, and so I think it's the most meaningful work of my career. That rather than say the industry or anything, what I would always encourage people to do is just allow yourself to go on the journey of your career. And don't expect it's going to be linear and it's going to be just like this. The interesting thing about life is it happens. You know, you're on the field, and so things will happen. May, be selective. Be good, um, a good partner. Don't be that guy, the guy or gal who nobody wants to work with because they're hard to get along with. You don't get your work done. We all know this because we have group projects, right? You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> Joe, really? I hate Joe. Joe never gets his stuff done, right? And that always is. I'm like, don't be Joe. Don't be Joe because it is very simple like that. It is very much like be somebody who isn't about themselves. Be somebody who is about enabling somebody else. Be interesting. Read broadly. Try new things. Fail. Fail a lot. That's how you learn. And there will be many failures in your career, and you should embrace them. Yeah. You should embrace them. Uh, there is that saying that if... Uh uh, if you don't have a Joe in your projects, it might be you. So yeah. that's, there's also <laughs> exactly. that. It might, might require a little hey. kind of inter introspection. <laughs> well, good. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question. Okay. And um, after that, we'll open the, open the floor for questions from you all. So if, if you have a question in mind, I think our, uh, I just encourage you to come to one of these mics here on the side. And um, I also might ask that if you have a question, you ask a pithy question. So uh, it's an opportunity to ask Beth a question, not to, uh, you know, get, have a ha have your own speech. We can do that later. Um, no. But, you know, so if you have something you want to say, feel free to make your way over to the mic. Uh, I just wanted to end on a kind of broader question about your thoughts on the future. You know, I mentioned Purdue's uh, celebration of 150 years. Actually, today we're celebrating my Department of Agricultural Economics 100th year. Um, and... Uh, as I, if I understand right, in about two years, Land O'Lakes will be 100, 100 years, years old. 100 years. Um, and so, you know, what are some of the big things you've seen, you know, the changes at Land O'Lakes, but maybe more important than that, you know, where is Land O'Lakes going to be 100 years from now? Or, you know, if that's too hard, maybe five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say even five years will be challenging yeah. because that's the speed of change, and we should all recognize that. You know, foundationally, the business started 1921, upper Midwest dairy farmers wanting to get power in the channel and get their sweet cream butter into the population centers in the east. So they formed this co-op. And that marketing co-op was successful. And then they, find, they, they formed a supply co-op that balanced the, to, for animal feed and other supplies. And so what was interesting about the evolution of Land O'Lakes is over time, very much like any business, they kind of got outside those kind of, this is the, the, the lane where we have strength, right? Instead, they got into other businesses, live animals. We got some hog produce production. We did an egg business because we 
We have an animal feed business. We know how to feed a chicken. Suddenly, we know the egg industry. You know, not true. And so I think that there was a, a kind of a, a, a decentralization of the structure and then got into other businesses that were somehow uh, aligned. And then um, you know, our last uh, CEO, Chris Polisinski, brought it back into an operating company model and put, pulled us back into the core areas where Land O'Lakes is differentiated from a farmer, so the animal nutrition business, the Winfield Technologies, and dairy. So I, I think that that's the case. Now, we have been going through a very challenging cycle, as you know, in agriculture right now. And so my job, the team's job, is to look at growth opportunities for the business going forward. And, um, and that's what we've been uh, very busy working on. And the exciting news for us was, geez, uh, the teams came up with over 100 and some ideas. So it's not like we lack any vision for what things are aligned with our portfolio or where things are growing. And in, then we, we take that work and we say, we're going to narrow it down to the top 14 or 15 because you can't do everything. And even 14 or 15 is a lot. And it's across all of the businesses. And from that, we're going to look at pockets of growth because there is still growing, uh, things growing. So like in grocery, very disrupted um, industry, you know, what's growing is uh, grocerant, you know, where you get your chicken and your salad at the grocery store or high-end deli. Um, there's a premiumization in the market. Um, so I say these things to say, think of the pace of change. Foundationally, the company is right here. We have to look at um, uh, things that are more directly aligned, uh, opportunities that are core. Hey, in the animal agriculture business, we didn't know that there was cattle that had moved in a particular area. Perhaps we should put some salespeople over there. You know, um, th There's some near-end things, and then there's some broader things. I think you're going to see something that's more insight-driven, more technology-focused, because we are, we are focused on insights and analytics. Um, we have big data. We have data silos. We have predictive analytics. So you're going to see something that is more focused like that. Um, I think you'll see us focusing on services. So I always say, who's winning in retail? And we are owned by local retailers in rural communities. Who's winning? Well, who's, who isn't winning? Well, we know J.C. Penney's, Sears, right? Sears, we always used to shop at Sears, right? I see that. Yeah, I got my tough skins there. It was good times. Um, and, and so why isn't? They didn't differentiate, because I can go get my white t-shirt anywhere. You have to have a differentiated service or a reason for someone to shop with you. So you'll see us working with our local retailers on omni-channel, on leverage of e-commerce and technology, on insights, a differentiated insight, because some of the companies that are winning, like Best Buy, why? Because they have a services model, right? And they're providing something that is of value to a consumer. So you'll see us work our portfolio that is tied to our fundamental foundational businesses, but actually also work on different services that are aligned with the things that we do. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you. Well, I want to give an opportunity for uh, those of you in the audience to ask a question. So looks like we have. Go ahead. Oh, just press first. I'm just helping manage. Oh, OK. Um, so <laughs> I think you haven't touched upon this. Uh, my question is about anti antibiotics in um, treatment of animals, because this can cause antibiotics resistance. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so what is your point on this? Well, I mean, a couple points. Now there is a requirement that you have a vet's uh, you know, prescription, very much like any of us going to the doctor, so that when you're using antibiotics, you, 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 you actually have a vet's prescription. I mean, the fact is that um, animals get sick. People get sick. You know, so sometimes antibiotic use is, is, um, is necessary. But we don't want to routinize it and just say, we're using this to increase production or things like that. So that, I think, has been a, a, we've been um, as an industry, it's been pulled back. But um, consistent with that, you still can get a vet's prescription if that's what you need. And that's what I, we're supportive of. Hi. Uh, Hi. So I had a question more on the front end. Like, what do you think will happen to physical grocery stores with an increase in online services like Amazon Fresh? And has this shift impacted your uh, selling or retail strategy? Yeah, it's a really. Great question, because there has been tremendous disruption in the grocery sector, and it does have carryover effects in multiple ways. Some of the grocery our grocery stores um, are getting into getting into 
um, and doing what businesses do. They go back and they look at the value chain and say, where are the profit pools? So they're getting into the, putting on their own animals, their own processing capability. And it's pressuring price, especially in milk. A lot of them are using dairy products, for instance, to try to drive traffic in the store. They know the mom or the dad needs to go in and get fresh milk for their, um, their kids. And so they're using it as a loss leader and it's pressuring the sector. And this, this whole click and carry, you know, that it is about, if you're a grocery retailer, getting people interested in coming in and shopping and getting people interested in shopping. What is it? Amazon has, has improved the efficiency of, of shopping, but they've ruined shopping, right? Because they've, they've ruined, you know, you going and kind of looking at a lot of different, different areas. So the plays that you used to use, using trade spend, using your brand, aren't quite as valuable um, or are challenged. The reality is, you know, it's not going to be just a price game. Many of these retailers um, are also putting on their own brands. They're putting on private label. So they're moving in the, um, in the sector to more private label. And so that means the margin structure for businesses is under challenge. Um, I think that that will just accelerate. And at this point, consumers are willing to trade off and do try different things. They weren't when I was growing up, you know, it was like, Wheaties, Rice Krispies, Cheerios. That was at my house. That was what we had. If you didn't like it, too bad. You weren't eating breakfast. And now you've got about, what, 100 different breakfast things. Um, and people are more willing to try that. So if you're a consumer goods company, as we are as well, you have to innovate. You must innovate. And you mustn't expect that you're going to have some big, huge, you know, grand release of a product and suddenly this is going to solve every margin issue you might have or product issue. It's going to be multiple things. You have to try it, and you have to be brutal about cutting things off that aren't working, because most things won't work. Amazon will tell you that, that probably 95 or more percent of what they try doesn't work, but they are outstanding at killing it and not getting too enamored with a business. So no matter whether it's click and carry, in the store, online, you have to innovate. And then you have to be able to showcase that innovation to consumers who are willing to try and change um, you know, m much more than anybody else was. Let's go over here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Mario. I'm a first year doctoral student in agricultural economics. Uh, my question is, what do you think might be a path forward to be, bridge the information gap between consumers and producers, especially when it comes to sustainability? And the word itself has a contested meaning, I guess, for different segments of the population. Yeah. Thank you. You know, um, the, our whole mission is to try to reduce the distance between consumers and um, agriculture and the people who create their food. So I think that your question is, is spot on. It's one of the things that we really focus on. Um, we, we spend a lot of time, it's not just marketing or talking about it. We have to show who, um, who we are and who the farmers are. Um, one of the things we did, there were two, two or three things that I thought were most fascinating around this journey. Um, at our annual meeting, um, we had a consumer panel, and that consumer panel was comprised of literally people off the street, you know. And uh, there were five of them, different, you know, some of them were retired, some of them were college students, whatever, talking about what did they know about food. Uh, they didn't know who this was, right? And I said to the, to the members, we're going to hear this, and you're going to hate what you hear. <laughs> you're not going to like it. It's going to make you upset. But you need to listen to what consumers, how consumers are making these judgments and what they think about agriculture. And I'll tell you, it was fascinating. And as they left, some of them was like, oh my goodness, we have so much, so much work to do. There is no magic answer to how are we going to inform a broad population. I do, and we do after that, and did after that, and constantly are working, A, with our members about policy issues to be in, in DC, but B, to be on social media, to tell their story, to make themselves accessible, ask a farmer, because we have to share information. That doesn't mean that things are going to change, but you know who's in charge right now? The, the consumer on social media. And so you have to share information, and you cannot be reluctant to do that. Um, otherwise, you know, that narrative is going to be out there. It's the same way I think of sustainability. Uh, you know, the best way to, 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 to make sure you can ensure your success is to get on the playing field and define what the playing field is. It is not helpful to just say, well, ugh, they don't know what they're talking about. Well, you know, unless you're going to get in there and define what true sustainable agriculture looks like, you're not, you're going to get what you get. 
and then it's going to move away from you. I promise that is what's happened with GMOs, everything else. So we need active dialogue from universities, as I mentioned, from all of you who understand production agriculture, and from, um, you know, and from our farmer members, and, and then, of course, our company. Yeah. Call out, John. Uh, one of the animal sciences uh, professors, uh, thank you for giving us, uh, I mean, contributing to our shiny new Lando Lakes uh, Center for Experiential Learning. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> we are the beneficiaries of that, and we thank you so much. Uh, the last 10 years has, been, has seen the rise of nationalism across the globe, in Europe, in South America, of course, here in, 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 in the United States. And this could create another layer of barrier you know to food supply you know food accessibility especially as we as we try to uh, ensure that people across the globe you know have foods on their table you know food security how can government i mean companies like you work to shape government thinking you know shape the thinking of our politicians so that uh, issues like this i was in china just a couple of weeks ago pork prices have risen about double and uh, they say, oh, but we can import pork from the U.S. So, you know, I, I know some of these barriers are there. How can companies like you shape the opinions of our politics? Well, a couple, um, a couple of reactions. Of course, we try to, as I was mentioning earlier, with our Venture 37 NGO, work with, um, work with smallholder farmers and others and government officials. So it's not just we're on the farm, yes, but we're working on policy issues in those countries um, working on economics issues, working on ways that they can develop a business. Um, so we, we try to work very directly. Here in the United States, you know, this hog production, yeah, you would sit there and say, boy, what an opportunity, African swine flu, you know, half or more of the hog population in China um, decimated, huge um, uh, industry for pork. Isn't this an opportunity for own hog producers? But they've had tariffs. Um, so again, you know, I spent an inordinate amount of time on policy issues, talking about the implications of that for farmers. Um, and you're right, the concern is food security. Why did we think that the, um, you know, the, the major challenges in the Middle East occurred a number of, um, what, the Arab Spring a number of years ago? And that was dealing in many ways with food shortage and rising prices that had been held down by the governments for so long and then that, were, that was lifted and, you know, you want to get a, a population unhappy, have them not be able to feed their families. That's, that's the issue. You look at the challenges right now going on in Central America, you know, Guatemala, the, the immigrants coming here, part of that is because of, of um, changes in the climate where they are not able to grow their own food anymore. We, in addition to policy issues, one of the other things I'll do in D.C., and I'm on the board for um, USGLC, um, uh, that is focused on international investment. Again, not because we say, oh, we want to be politicians, but these policy issues are central to food security, which is, which is important to our business um, and to our members, and we believe is, is important you know, to agriculture in general. So there are, again, it, it requires you to investigate and, and, um, and get yourself uh, you know, aligned with what the true uh, policy issues are. Um, from an economics perspective, from a political perspective, and we'll, I will speak to anybody about things that impact our farmers, um, agriculture, and rural communities. And I don't, I don't need to be a Republican or Democrat for that conversation. It really is what do I understand would be the implications of these changes. You're going to see a rising um, uh, issue of disparity in some, that is going to be pressured by, I think, climate change in some of these areas where you see this immigration, and now it I kind of all fits together. Um, and, and we're going to have to deal with that. Thank you. Let's take one last question here. Hi, my name is Brianna Britton. I'm a PhD student in food science. Yes. Um, and kind of, I guess, piggybacking off the last question, you mentioned that you guys are involved in a lot of uh, projects that are funded by USAID. And I was wondering what you think the US's predominant role um, in the international sector is, more specifically, I guess, related to food security. Well, I think, again, you know, we, we Many people are concerned about immigration, um, about investments outside the, the borders of the United States. Um, I think we're supportive of investment that not only grows the market, so that's great for our members, but we understand that stabilizes a country's political environment and it makes it least, less likely. I mean, it's not like everybody's dying to pick up roots and, 
and lead their country. Um, so it, it develops or it, it drives security in that country. Um, and thus, they're able to stay and build, um, build a, a, an economy and, and their um, families and support their families. So I think, you know, when, when I think of these policy issues, we're supportive of those kinds of investments. Um, and we think that they're central to, you know, to a country's stability and thus central to our own security and the things that we're trying to do here in the United States. I, you know, too frequently, I think we get into this demonization conversation about these things, and some of them just see, seem fundamental. And every time I have these conversations, it's not a Republican or a Democrat thing. There are many places on both sides of the aisle um, uh, that are supportive of making appropriate investments where they know it deals with a, a food security issue um, or a stability in the country issue. Well, Beth, you've given us a lot of great things to think about. I uh, really like your, your uh, concept of a shared destiny between rural and urban America and also between uh, farmers and the consumer. Um, I, I like your challenge to us here at the university to uh, be uh, engaged in the conversations around science and technology. Um, that, that's an important role for us to play as, as a unbiased arbiter uh, around some of these issues. And if I understood you right, you'd also like us to eat more butter. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we also have cheese. And cheese, okay. And cozy yeah. chat pudding and other things that are, they're just nummy. Yeah, so, yes, well, very good. Well, uh, join me in thanking uh, Beth for taking time. Yeah. Thank you so much.